first of all, thank you for joining us uh, either for the first time or again today uh, to, in our series about building back better. Today we'll be focusing on forests and farms. As many of you will know, uh, between them, agriculture and forestry account for around, well, there's some debate on this, but up to around 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Forests obviously also draw down carbon, so this is a very complex calculation which different people come at from different angles. But it is an important area for carbon. It's also an important area for Canada. And certainly when I first came to Canada, I come from an agricultural background. And when I first came to Canada as a new Canadian, um, I was surprised that Canada didn't see itself as an agricultural nation. Forests, yes, but you know, agricultural powerhouse seemed to be not in the national psyche in the way that I thought it might be. I think now is the time perhaps to change that. We'll hear from, from uh, many of our fantastic panelists today about what can be done and how these two parts of the economy can be part of building back better. So let me pass you over now to uh, Toby to give a word of welcome and then we'll get on with the discussion. Thanks, Diane, and, and welcome everybody. This is our, our fifth week in the, the seven week series. And uh, just uh, one quick observation that's interesting there's a lot of gathering momentum each week. We see more and more momentum for this economic recovery to be a, a green recovery, a resilient recovery. And it was nice to see a big study come out by uh, Oxford University led by Joseph Stieglitz showing the perceptions of different actors in society about the job multipliers of various stimulus and recovery options, as well as the academic literature and the evidence, the empirical evidence in terms of where the jobs are from the different recovery investment options from the standard ones to some of the, the greener ones. And what they found was some of the, the highest job multipliers that exist are in things like building upgrades for energy efficiency and various other upgrades to clean, clean energy infrastructure. But when you pull the finance minister's offices, um, who are probably the most important stakeholder in making this decision, there's a general lack of familiarity and awareness with these multipliers, and they tend to rank them on the lower end. So there's, there's some education to do and some pro proving um, to do to, to ensure that uh, we're making good evidence-based policy because in many cases the the green recovery option is at least as job intensive as a gray or, or brown recovery option and so if if we look at it that way and we let climate be the tiebreaker we'll be well on our way to a to a resilient and green recovery in terms of what we're going to talk about this week we're looking at farms and forests and we have some complementary suggestions but the two core proposals that we're looking at are to up the ambition of Canada's tree planting program from two billion trees over a decade to 10 billion trees, so 10 billion trees planted, and to also help to transform 10 million acres of marginal farmland to be productive carbon reservoirs and biologically diverse and rich uh, eco zones. Um, so th those things will both require money in the order of about $2 billion per year. To put that in context, that's about 0.1% of our GDP. It would uh, lead to an estimated 20,000 annual full-time jobs per year. And in the, um, the average uh, carbon emissions reductions annualized between 2020 and 2050 would be about 50 million tons of reduced carbon emissions per year. So that's uh, what we're gonna be looking at today. We are the only G7 country uh, not to have an environmental goods and services policy embedded in our agricultural policy. So this is a good time for us to, to get on with it. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Diana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby. Uh, let me, um, encourage you during this next hour to uh, add your questions and comments in the Q&A panel. Because we're quite busy with speakers, we may not answer the questions online, but we will be downloading them, getting to them, uh, and thinking about them as Toby uh, and his team develop these uh, ideas further. So please do do that. I'm going to pass over now to David Martin, who is chair of WWF Canada, to give us an introduction around nature. Hi. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diana. And I know we're going to be drilling down into forests and, um, and, and farms, but I, I appreciate having this dialogue today um, because what you and, and Toby are really doing is you're, you're incorporating nature and biodiversity in Canada's recovery into your thought process. And this is a, an essential component that uh, needs to happen, yet isn't getting much attention. And it probably, because conservation doesn't necessarily produce the immediate impacts every, everyone is looking for right now, but they are fundamentally wrong to ignore it. Investing in nature and conservation is very much about protecting the economy and jobs and preventing disasters. Just look at where we are right now. 
COVID-19 is generally framed as a public health crisis and an economic crisis, but this is fundamentally missing the boat. It hasn't just been health officials warning us about pandemics. Climate scientists have been doing this as well. We are on the fourth major zoonotic inf infectious disease since 2000. Think about that. That's only 20 years. And the key driver of these pandemics is, has been our unhealthy relationship with nature. We are the ones destroying habitats, trading in live high-risk wildlife, creating ideal conditions for potential uh, pandemic outbreaks. And our impact on climate is allowing the range of disease carrying and insects and other vectors to grow exponentially. So I, I just wanted to start and make this point because you know, we can keep throwing significant sums of money to mitigate health and economic challenges we face now or in the future, or we can consciously invest part of this money now into the very thing that can prevent these same challenges, nature. So if nature-based solutions, uh, which is essentially what we're talking about, if nature-based solutions are not part of any green recovery plan, whatever policies are put in place simply won't be as effective. Why? Well, nature and biodiversity account for approximately $125 trillion of economic value. Now that's a global number, so you can extrapolate that to represent Canada. But however you do that, a couple things will be abundantly clear. It is significant, it is largely free, and unfortunately, it's declining to our detriment. We need to see our enormous carbon sinks in Canada as a competitive advantage. Our coastlines with large eelgrass and kelp forests, our wetlands, our peat bogs, our grasslands, old growth forests, all of these, protecting them and investing in them stops the detonation of a carbon bomb that we'll have to deal with later. And let me just finish on one uh, uh, final uh, point. You know, I've been following the, the, the general conversation around recovery plans, and I'm, I'm happy that, they're, that the language is moving away from being sort of shovel ready to being shovel worthy. Capital spending on nature is easy. Worker train, trainer requirements are low. Many projects have minimal planning and procurement requirements. Many aspects of work meet social distancing norms. It unlocks the value that civil society can bring. It does all this, all the while maintaining fundamental economic multipliers that we're gonna be hearing about that come from such investment. Jobs, lower healthcare costs, strengthening relationship with indigenous communities, just to name a few. So on that, uh, I look forward to hearing the, the, uh, the rest of the presentations and as we drill down more into uh, uh, farms and forests and, uh, and looking forward to the conversation that ensues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That was a great introduction and a great segue into Ralph, uh, who will uh, tell us a little bit more about those proposals that Toby mentioned. Ralph, you're on mute. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, David, for an excellent uh, context setting introduction, uh, which covered some of the things I, I was uh, intending to say, which will give more time to our panelists, which is not a good thing. Uh, when we set about over the last little while to develop our ideas for where is the overlap between economic recovery and things that we need to be doing to restore the sustainability and the health of our forest and agricultural ecosystems. We often ran up against the conflict in the sense that these systems take a long time to change. They don't turn on a dime and it takes a certain amount of patience and uh, to, to, to get those changes in place. And at a time when we're looking for quick fixes and quick job creation schemes, it was a little more challenging to see where the overlap was here than in some of the other topics that we've been covering. But it certainly wasn't difficult to see essentially the points that David was making about the importance of our natural ecosystems to our public health, to our economic health, and really to what it is to be Canadian. Our, our agricultural and forest ecosystems in particular have been supporting Canadians long before European contact, long before the disruption of the fossil fuel era. And when the pandemic hit, 
they were both in trouble, I think it's fair to say. The forest industry has been in decline in this country for 15 years or more now uh, due to a number of uh, structural changes in its market. The agricultural uh, industry, if we want to call it that, is clearly operating on an unsustainable model that is very highly dependent on fossil fuel intensive inputs that are problematic both environmentally and economically for the farmer. It's not a sustainable model. So the pandemic pause, as I've started calling it, gives us a chance to think about when we come out of this and when we rebuild our economy, where are the opportunities to get these two big important aspects of Canadian life, our agricultural and our forestry systems, moving in a more sustainable direction. We came up with two specific ideas and the panel will help explain uh, the broader context and the, the, the richer nature of these suggestions. But in the area of forestry, uh, we're proposing that the commitment that's already been made for increasing the afforestation efforts in Canada, and this is by the way, in addition to what industry already does in terms of replacement planting, uh, to increase the commitment the government has already made to 200 million uh, trees up to 800 million trees more. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a $1.6 billion proposal. It will create 15,000 jobs a year using pretty modest multipliers uh, in reference to the point Toby made earlier. And when the trees get going, and it takes time, uh, we see at least a 30 million ton per year carbon sequestration benefit. And, and of course, when it comes to these natural carbon cycles, the, the sequestration is not permanent. But the strategic issue here is that we will get those tons if we start now, we will get those tons when the trees are in their prime during that 2030 to 2050 period when they're growing fast and we, will, we are going to be looking for every help we can get in uh, dealing with the imbalance in the carbon cycle. So I think that's what, in terms of flattening the curve of, of the GHG emission uh, crisis that we're facing, this is where sequestration options have a particularly important role to play. Uh, on the agricultural side, and there's a number of people who can speak in much more detail about this than, than I can, uh, I've been more of a witness to the formulation of this proposal over the last week but it's to invest in uh, farmers' ability to convert marginal land to basically uh, forestation. And in addition, there's a secondary proposal that involves helping farmers reduce their dependence on, on uh, nitrogen, fossil fuel-based nitrogen fertilizers. With respect to the uh, restoration of marginal lands or the increased productivity of marginal lands. The proposal is for a $400 million uh, program over 10 years, as are most of our proposals, to take 10 million acres of marginal farmland uh, and develop that into effective carbon sinks to the point where we would be getting a 22 million ton per year carbon benefit uh, by, the, by the end of the 2020s. Uh, again, very job uh, intensive, 5,600 jobs here, 15,000 jobs in the forestry proposal I, meant, uh, I mentioned earlier. So these are the two specific ideas that we've zeroed in on for, agri for forestry and agriculture that we think overlap very uh, neatly with the uh, economic uh, recovery agenda and which at the same time uh, allow us to give a boost towards moving these two big systems in the direction of, of sustainability. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to the experts. Uh, no, Ralph, you're the expert, the general expert for, for these, this <laughs> series. So thank you for that. Thank you for those proposals. We'll try and get a bit more detail um, on those proposals now. And I think the way we're going to do that is we're going to start with the forests and then move on to farms, even though there are obviously links between them. So who better to start with than um, Damon Hardy, who's Executive Director of Forest International. Thanks, Diana. Yeah, I, and that was a great intro by David and Ralph, and I'll just pick up on forests. I mean, one thing to set the context here, 
Canada is basically one of the largest forests on earth, really. Like in terms of forest area by nation, we're right up there with Brazil's Amazonian rainforest. And this vast forest that surrounds us and that we all enjoy and that provides so much for us um, is big enough to really make the difference this decade to you know, reverse climate breakdown. But uh, unfortunately, the reality is right now, our forest actually emits more carbon than it sequesters because of our intensive cutting and increasingly frequent disturbances like fire. Because of course, as a tree grows, it, it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and brings it back home on earth where it belongs and puts it into living systems. But when you cut down that tree or, or if it burns, the emissions are, are released back into the atmosphere. Um, and, and Canada is also home to, you know, some of the best foresters in the world, some of the best forest institutions. And it's well within, you know, their abilities to re-optimize our forestry sector for carbon drawdown and, and climate security. But, you know, really, nobody's really asking them to do that. So if we started asking our forestry sector to, you know, make Canada a leader in climate smart forestry, and we did that through our, our policy signals, and our market incentives and our, our R&D investment and just in how we think and talk about our relationship to forests now in this time of biodiversity and climate crisis, I know that they would rise to the occasion. And if we do that, we're gonna see a, like a huge surge in employment in the sector as well, because as was mentioned in the intro, um, it's been in decline for a lot of years and careful climate smart management for climate security requires a lot of really specialized work at, at all levels. I was reading a, a story in the New York Times yesterday about the Conservation Corps, how President Roosevelt in the Depression era created this uh, solution to tackling massive youth employment and a backlog of restoration and conservation work in, in the US. And he launched it in the early 30s and over 10 years, you know, it employed over 3 million people. They did a lot of good work. They planted more than 3 billion trees. So, you know, if we look at expanding Canada's two billion tree program, make it much more ambitious to the 10 billion tree mark over the next decade and combine that with natural infrastructure investments. There's a lot of shovel worthy natural infrastructure projects ready to grow across Canada. And you know, smart investments in, in green professions because we want, we want investments that create jobs right now but that are you know, jobs that are good for today and the future. And it's the conservation economy and the low carbon economy you know, that, that is the future. So I see a lot of promise there. I mean, where I work here on the East Coast in the Acadian Forest region, we've got around 80,000 family forest operators who are ready to get to work protecting and restoring their forests for climate security. Um, they just need you know, an, an enabling environment. And because the conditions are so marginal right now under business as usual, it really wouldn't take much of investment to, to shift the mode. I mean, the, the United Nations is warning us that we have 126 months left now to turn the ship. And they've offered us four pathways out of this climate crisis. And forests are key in all of them. They're just so important. You know, they're, they're really a deal breaker. And there are three things that are giving me a lot of hope right now in terms of what we can do and what Canada's role can be. One, of course, is the crisis responsibilities that we're all proving right now. I'm not the first to say it, but we've just changed everything in our lives and in our economy very quickly. And that shows that we can act fast. The second is when you work with forests or, or farms or any natural system, you realize what a, a huge capacity for renewal they have. And I don't think there's really any limit to the possibilities when you know, people work with forests in a more regenerative way. And then the third, which is the biggest, is just this return of indigenous leadership to the land and and the return of the original caregivers to the land that we're seeing in Canada. You know, some of the most exciting innovations in forests and climate security over the last number of years have been indigenous led. And some of the most exciting proposals around forests on the table right now are indigenous led. I was reading about one um, from the, the Satu Dene. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct, but the Satu Dene, a 25 million acre protected area in the boreal forest that could store upwards of 35 years worth of Canada's annual greenhouse gas emissions. And you know that's the type of thing that we need to be supporting. Um, we've learned in the environmental movement and in the climate movement that we can't really make good durable progress uh, on environmental issues unless we also you know 
create social change and, and make progress on justice as well. So I think a green recovery with forests, um, it, it, it won't be effective unless it's also a just recovery. And so that means putting people who are most directly connected to the forests, you know, in the industry and on the land, really at the center of our solutions. And so in addition to modernizing our forest industry to meet these climate imperatives and stay competitive, I think the biggest opportunity is rematriating more forest lands to indigenous care. And the, the science is really clear on that, that indigenous and other collective communities, they do a better job of keeping forests and their critical carbon stores intact over the long term. And that's exactly what we need right now. So yeah, so let's listen to these experts um, and step out of the way because you know the forests and the climate and the economy needs saving right now. We need that to happen right now. And these are the, the people and experts who can help us do that. Thank you so much. A couple of questions have appeared in the chat window and it's all about how, how do we do better with our existing forests uh, of reduce emissions from those and, and there are examples of countries that are doing that much better than us. Uh, you mentioned the, the indigenous role in forest management. So I think I'm gonna turn over right now to Valerie Kutwa, who's uh, director of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative and get her opinion on this. Valerie, please. Thank you, Diana. And thank you all for, for hosting this panel. It's a, it's a real honor to join you. Um, and Damon, Damon, thank you for setting me up uh, so well uh, for, for my, um, my contribution. <clears throat> Indigenous peoples in Canada really are at the forefront of the conservation movement. I, you know, I've been in this career for about 20 years now, and I'd say uh, over 90% of all new protected areas proposals in Canada have either been led or co-led by Indigenous peoples. Um, in fact, uh, if Canada is going to achieve its goal of 25 to 30 percent conservation inter um, in which it, it uh, will pledge to do um, internationally, uh, it, it needs to work with Indigenous peoples and, and, and we're poised to, to do that. Um, you're right, the Satu Dene is a great example, you know, the community of Delaunay, which is the only community on the on Great Bear Lake, uh, which is one of the largest lakes uh, interior to Canada. Would, would conserve about 34 years of Canada's emission. And in fact, the boreal forest um, itself holds about 11% uh, of the globe's emissions. And so this conservation movement is essential. And we can talk about restoration and planting new trees, but first and foremost, we have to keep what's in the land there. And uh, when Indigenous peoples are at the lead of, of that land use planning and, and um, and deciding on, on how lands are to be used, on average, that protection ranges from 60 to 80% of those landscapes. Um, the other side of the coin to protected areas and to good management of lands is uh, guardians. Um, so these are, are what I like to call our moccasins and mucklucks on the ground or our boots on the ground, um, who are actively managing uh, these forests and these landscapes uh, for the benefit of all. Um, if you can check out uh, landneedsguardians.ca for more information on, on what guardians do. Um, investment in such guardian programs, in fact, has an important social return on investment, uh, which was also mentioned by Damon. Uh, so for every dollar invested right now, we've measured uh, approximately $3 in, in, in return on, on social and economic um, uh, benefits. Those include things like reduce rates of violence against women or reduce rates of incarceration, increase language retention. All of the things that we've been talking about through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work, through the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls work, um, that is important for resetting the relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples in Canada. Currently, there are about 60 existing programs, uh, guardian programs across the country. And this has been an exponential growth in the last couple of years, thanks to some investments both by the federal government, but also by Indigenous nations themselves uh, in, in these programs. And I've, I've had the benefit of, of managing and, and working with guardians for the last 20 years. And uh, what I see is when guardians are present, the, depth, the deepening and, and, and kind of more meaningful relationship can be created with proponents, with other land users, with other Canadians. And to me, that's, that's really reconciliation in action. It provides an opportunity in a landscape that we all recognize and identify with 
to have deep conversations about about the future of those landscapes and what our role and responsibility to those landscapes are. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that, Diana, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, great questions from, from the participants. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to know what's going on. And I, I'm gonna now turn um, to Rob Keane, who's CEO of Forest Ontario. And Rob, perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about what's required, what kind of capital, what kind of jobs could be created in the sector through the measures that Ralph's talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Diana. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning, and in particular to get a bit of a glimpse of everybody's home uh, working environment, what's very comfortable for all. So that's great. Uh, perhaps a bit of a in context with, with where we are with uh, our tree planting activities uh, in Canada, specifically with afforestation tree planting, which is essentially the creation of new forests. Uh, but first, just to realize that the forest industry of Canada currently plants between 500 million to 600 million trees per year. Now they are legally required to do this. It's a reforestation and it's for the privilege of being able to harvest off of uh, public lands, crown lands. Uh, so that gives you some notion, okay, well, that's, that's obviously some pretty big numbers, but again, legally required reforestation. Um, and in fact, it's recognized by third party certification that here in Canada, we actually have some of the best managed forests in the world because of the forest industry, because of the, the abundance of public lands that are being harvested and the regulations that go with that. When we start talking about uh, tree planting on lands that haven't traditionally had trees on them for a number of years, that's generally referred to as afforestation. And predominantly the, the talk of what, you know, the 2 billion target that's been identified or the 10 billion target, uh, certainly for this, uh, this session, um, that's the type of tree planting that's being described, and it's the creation of new forests across the landscape. Um, Forest Ontario actually has been doing this for a number of years, uh, certainly here in Ontario uh, with the 50 million tree program and across Canada with Forest Recovery Canada. So we do have, you know, some, some history with that tree planting activity. To give you an idea of the amount of afforestation going on, we're probably looking at around 10 million uh, trees per year. Uh, across Canada that be planted under the afforestation system. Uh, when we talked about the 2 billion commitment over 10 years, that's 200 million trees per year. Of course, then you go to the 10 billion tree commitment, that's, that's a billion trees per year. So that's, a, that's quite a required increase in overall capacity to achieve those types of numbers. Not that it can't be done, it's a great, it's, it, it needs to happen. It's a, you know, the nature-based solutions that Damon was referring to is, is absolutely essential here to create that amount of new forest. But it's just, it just, you know, it's in perspective of, okay, how much capacity do we actually have to increase uh, to achieve those types of targets? And I think it's also really important for folks to recognize that tree planting is, is more than just planting a tree in the ground. There's a whole, a whole ream, ream of uh, activities associated to ensuring but once you plant the trees, you will eventually achieve a healthy forest. And it starts right from the seed collection. And you're looking for knowing where the seed is coming from. It's called seed sourcing. You're talking about stock development, uh, getting the nurseries to start growing more. You're training people to do, do the tree planting properly. You're following up with monitoring. And then you're even following up with adaptation practices, recognizing that climate change will have an impact on our forests as much as increasing the forest cover can help mitigate climate change. So it's all these things that play into ensuring that we move forward and create healthy forests uh, for the future. And it really is, a, the coin phrase is we've got to look towards having the right tree in the right place for the right reason. And I think that really says a lot for what we're trying to do right across Canada. I have had discussions with a number of uh, folks involved in this, in all of the various facets of a successful tree planting program. And certainly the, the comments um, shared uh, to me have been that, and everybody's very interested in participating in, in this, uh, but what is absolutely essential is the long-term guaranteed sustainable funding that needs to be in place to support the capacity growth that we're certainly all, you know, with all the different facets that I mentioned, uh, to support that capacity growth. And I've talked to nurseries out in, in uh, Western Canada and BC, and they say, that's great, you know, that people, we want to have this ambitious target, but in order for them to truly invest in their own infrastructure, 
they need to have a, a, at least that 10 year window of guaranteed funding to do so. And that's right across all the, the different aspects of this, everybody's saying the same thing. So, you, you know, it can't be just a, a year by year line item in a budget. There needs to be some sort of guarantees, some policies developed there to make sure that if people are going to start investing in this, and we do have, as, as Damon said, we have an extremely skilled forestry sector uh, in Canada. Uh, but in order, for, again, for everybody to invest in that, we have to make sure that that funding is there. The other, uh, the other aspects of this, and certainly, and it was actually, um, Laura, I'll give this credit to you with uh, Alice Canada, um, was we, got, we really need to ensure that we have people on the ground that can meet with, uh, in our case, woodlot owners, or Laura mentioned this the other day, just being able to talk to farmers and, and meet face to face on how to do restoration, how to encourage landowners and create the incentives for landowners to want to contribute their lands to the societal benefit. When in case there are landowners that we need to engage with, certainly in Southern Ontario, that's the case. People, it's, it's you know, I was having seen this over a number of years, a lot of the tendencies these days are, well, let's create a website, put some information on it, and everybody can go to the website and figure out how to manage their, their, their woodlot or farms or forests or whatever it might be. And the reality is people want to talk with people about what they're potentially going to be doing with their forests. So it really, really is important that, you know, that opportunity is there. The resources are contributed to being able to make that happen. And, uh, and I think, it, and again, getting people understanding more of how important it is to sustainably manage for us and to, to make sure that they're healthy goes with that kind of communication with whoever the landowners are on the particular forest. So I think there's a, there's a, this is a great opportunity. Um, this whole, you know, currently the 2 billion target, but like, I'd love to see it go to the 10 billion. We've got a, just a huge opportunity to create these nature-based solutions. Um, but we just got to make sure we do it right. You know, and, and there's all sorts of experts here that are indicating how that can happen. Um, but that needs to be the focus, right tree, right place for the right reason. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rob. We have a, a couple of questions and comments in about the point you made around whether we have the right workforce. You know, we perhaps have a skilled workforce in some areas, but whether we're empowering youth enough in this area, um, indigenous youth in particular, and whether the, the schools uh, providing enough forestry training to support this this development. I think that's something that we won't have time to go into today, but we will think about offline. I'm going to pass over now to Sephora Berman. And many of you will know her. She is International Program Director at Stand Earth. And then she's been thinking a good deal about, about what we do with our forest products, amongst other things. So perhaps you could come and comment on your thoughts, Sephora. Thank you. Um... Uh, it's um, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, our time is short, um, so I'll uh, focus really on two messages. I think it's very clear uh, that we need to listen to the science um, and we need to protect what we have. We all share a lived experience now of what happens when we do listen to the science and when we act quickly. And we know here that COVID is not the only curve uh, that we need to flatten. Building back better uh, means bending and flattening the curve on greenhouse gas emissions. And building back better means prioritizing companies, industries, plans, and infrastructure that protect what we have, protect biodiversity, stored carbon, ecosystem services, and stopping or winding down those that do not. The focus on tree planting in these recommendations is a very Canadian approach. We don't want to rock the boat on existing industries. Um, but I think we need to be clear when we look at the science, our forest policies mirror policies from the 60s in Europe, Agric our agricultural policies maybe from the 80s in Europe, and neither of them focus on maintaining ecosystems as the foundation of resiliency. In, in fact, Europe's now scrambling uh, to undo those effects, to rewild. So last month, a study in Nature on irrecoverable carbon, scientists detailed that vast stores of carbon are being released and can't be restored by 2050. The study calls for the next generation of protected areas network across critical ecosystems with high irrecoverable carbon stocks. 
Then two weeks ago, a groundbreaking report commissioned by the Treasury in the UK assessed the economic value of biodiversity and concluded that current high rates of biodiversity loss pose a major risk to our economies and our way of life. Just as diversity within a portfolio of financial assets reduces risk and uncertainty. Diversity within a portfolio of natural assets, biodiversity, directly and indirectly increases nature's resilience to shocks, reducing the risk to services on which we rely. We've heard a lot this morning already about how boreal forests store more carbon per hectare than any other ecosystem on earth, probably other forest ecosystem except mangroves. Yet right now, every year, logging companies are clear cutting 400,000 hectares, about a million acres of boreal forest. That's about seven NHL hockey rinks per minute. To research in BC has shown that following a clear cut, there's a minimum of a 13 year window where the logged and replanted area no longer sequesters carbon. So this analysis suggests that clear cutting is preventing forests in BC from removing an additional 26.5 million tons of carbon dioxide per year from the atmosphere. So the point is that maintaining older biodiverse forests draws down carbon levels and helps buffer imperiled ecosystems against the impacts of climate change. But more than that, uh, protecting intact forests also makes nearby communities more resilient to climate impacts such as droughts and fires and wildfire. So last month, Stand.Earth Earth released an investigative report on Canada's growing wood pellet industry, and I urge you to take a look at it. Because what we're seeing is that pellets are heavily subsidized. They're touted by our governments as a climate solution. But growing the wood pellet industry in Canada doubles down on carbon emissions, first by instant releasing a forest stored carbon at the smokestack, and second by driving the further degradation of forests. So listen to the science. In the words of IPCC scientist, Professor Emeritus Bill Muma of Tufts um, just last month, if we let some of our existing natural forests grow, we could remove an additional 10 to 20% of what we emit every year. But instead, we're paying subsidies to have people cut them down burn them in place of coal and counting it as zero carbon. So in some, we need to focus on protecting high biodiversity areas, carbon rich primary intact and old growth forest landscapes. The idea that we're still allowing critical caribou habitat to be logged in this country to make toilet paper. When our own scientists have said we need to protect those forests needs to stop now. We need to support indigenous guardian programs, as we've heard, employment centered on land restoration, economic diversification in these forest communities to create more jobs. And it really is time to reimagine the fiber industry in much the same way we're starting to reimagine energy and oil. We can add jobs and economic vitality with a value added job strategy. We can build furniture, we can make things and stop shipping raw logs and wood pellets while clear cutting our forests, which are the planet's carbon pools. We can search out alternative fiber, fiber supplies, recycled fiber, agricultural waste. We need to update our forest practices to reflect adaptation science, ecosystem-based management that maintains or restores original forest complexity rather than the existing practices which are designed to ensure maximum extraction. Selective logging, for example, in coastal forests, FSC logging across the country, it will employ more people. And then finally, we need to get honest about carbon accounting. We have a broken carbon accounting system when it comes to terrestrial carbon. We're not accounting for emissions from logging old forests or methane emissions from peat and soil disturbance. A recent paper in Waterloo showed that just from oil and gas exploration from seismic lines in Alberta alone, these undocumented emissions would boost Canada's national reporting of methane in the category of land use in land use and forestry by about 8%. Instead of tearing down nature, we need to rebuild our systems and protect the abundance that we have. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, that, you know, with great passion, that plea. I think uh, we're, we're, we're with you on that. And I think the idea that we should make use of this crisis, both to listen to science, but also to really rethink the way we're doing things rather than be very incremental in our thinking and just throw things on top. It was a really good wake up call. You talked about usage of the products. I'm going to pass over now to Magali Depress, who's from uh, TC Transcontinental, which, as you know, is a huge uh, packaging uh, and printing company. Your thoughts, Magali? 
Thank you very much, Diana. Pleasure to be here with all of you and thank you for having me. So uh, my point uh, will be, you know, how can business support uh, the conservation of forests and, and provide you a few examples of uh, where we think we, we, can, uh, we can support uh, your efforts. Uh, I share with you what uh, what TC Transcontinental has done in, in terms of forest conservation. As you as you've said, we're the largest Canadian printer. We we purchase paper, obviously, and. Uh, uh, for decades, we've been engaged in, with the supply chain in, first of all, you know, uh, with our procurement practices, ensuring that the, the paper we, we, we purchase uh, comes from uh, uh, certified uh, paper sources. Uh, we've, we've been implementing this for, for a number of years, and now I'm, I'm pleased to report that 100% of the paper we purchase is certified. The second uh, item has been uh, to engage with uh, NGOs such as Canopy in, in uh, protecting uh, endangered forests and engaging our uh, paper suppliers and our supply chain to, um, to have responsible practices. Um, so uh, we, we've done a number of things. Uh, I, I'll provide you an example with the Broadback Forest in Quebec, uh, where we were uh, able to support and protect 9,000 uh, square kilometers of, of forest. Uh, so it's been always in our, you know, um, responsible practices and, and corporate social responsibility. The last point I, I would like to make today, um, we're talking about, um, the circular economy and, and how we can you know, create uh, jobs and new innovations and opportunities. Um, in uh, in uh, the past, uh, the, the recycled paper industry was alive. You know, it was before we started shipping those recycled bales to, to Asia. But since uh, now Asia you know, has, made a, has, has made a stop on the imports of um, of those wastes. Uh, this is, in my opinion, a new opportunity for us to revisit uh, how we could uh, increase the usage of recycled paper in our productions. Um, we have already engaged in projects with, uh, with paper mills to look at ways of um, you know, restarting their assets that they had not uh, used so much and, and try to, to produce more uh, recycled paper for us. In the past, just to give you an example, up to 40% of recycled paper has been used in, in paper production. So I believe this is a, a great opportunity with uh, economic uh, benefits and environmental benefits that, uh, that we should uh, revisit. And, and TC Transcontinental is definitely engaging in looking at it with our with our partners with our supply chain so in terms of government support that you uh, mentioned about at the beginning I think government support is uh, is essential obviously in, in, in ensuring that we, we protect and safeguard our ecosystems and our forests but it's also important to have their their intervention and subventions in terms of innovation in terms of uh, uh, making sure that we are creating this circular economy uh, for, for paper. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the couple of examples I wanted to share with you and happy to take uh, questions if there's any. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to move swiftly on now, I'm afraid, to, to agriculture. We've already got some questions in the Q&A window about agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Who better to start with on the agriculture side than Darren Qualman, who's Director of Climate Policy and Action at the National Farmers Union. Darren, let's hear your views. Thank you very much, and I uh, hope you can hear me okay. There's a fairly intense thunderstorm where I, where I am right now, and uh, the farmers here will all be happy for the rain. Uh, I'm gonna sort of lay the groundwork uh, in terms of understanding and missions, and then uh, Jane is gonna uh, give some of the specifics of where we are on uh, farmers for climate solutions. But uh, if you if we only know one thing about agriculture and emissions and this the path forward, uh, key to understanding agricultural greenhouse gas emissions is this: they are the result of agricultural input use. Uh, to a very large extent, they're the result of agricultural input use. And uh, as farmers' use of purchased agricultural inputs increases, so do on-farm emissions. Uh, therefore, it follows inescapably that any low emission food production system 
must be a low input food production system. And I just, I just want to underline that with a bit of a historical example. Humans have practiced agriculture for 10,000 years. And for 99% of that time, it was low input, low fossil fuel use, low emission. It didn't affect the atmospheric composition much. It didn't affect the climate. It didn't push us toward uh, climate chaos. It's only in the last 1% as we've massively increased the injection of petroleum intensive inputs into our food production system that those emissions became a problem. So clearly we need to focus to a very large extent on those agricultural inputs. This need to reduce agricultural input use can be good news for farmers because as we reduce over dependence on purchased inputs, we can increase farmers' margins and their net incomes. So generally, what is needed at this moment is an integrated suite of government policies and on-farm measures to reduce input use and greenhouse gas emissions. Especially critical is we need thousands of new independent agrologists to transfer knowledge from uh, research organizations, universities, etc., and really work with farmers to find alternatives and to help them reduce reliance on petroleum intensive uh, farm inputs. And, and you know, in the context of this discussion, uh, th this will really deliver a triple win. We can uh, raise net farm incomes by reducing costs. We can reduce input uh, emissions rather as we uh, reduce dependence on petroleum derived inputs. And uh, we, can, we can reduce emissions boost net farm income and create employment all at the same time. The NFU lays out a, a detailed roadmap on this front. Uh, in the fall of 2019, we released a report called Tackling the Farm Crisis and the Climate Crisis, a Transformative Strategy for Canadian Farms and Food Systems uh, with a number of other organizations. The NFU has uh, worked to create the uh, collaboration the coalition farmers for climate solutions and there really are we can do to simultaneously increase the resilience and incomes of farmers and also uh, decrease the emissions from the Canadian food production system thank you thank you Darren and apologies if it was a little bit shaky there if you got that I'm going to pass lots of great points there, but since we're running short of time, I'm going to pass directly on to Jane, who is the Executive Director of Seed Change and has already been flagged by you, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. D Darren was there to, to tee up the issues and I'm here to talk about solutions. Um, I want to kind of just start by marking the moment that we're in right now. And I've been working in food systems my entire career from all different angles, and I have never seen the degree of awareness of the food system that we are currently experiencing right now from all angles. So from the production side of things, labor, people aware of temporary foreign workers, their contributions and the issues they face, people aware of issues and bottlenecks and concentration in food processing, people aware of how many people in Canada actually um, are experiencing food insecurity, are at the threshold of food insecurity, and have been catapulted into food insecurity because of the crisis. So the, the impact of the crisis across the food system is, is so clear. And I, again, I've never seen this level of awareness of the importance of the food system, the people in the food system, um, and the vulnerabilities in the food system among Canadians. Um, and it just creates, obviously, the imperative um, but also the opportunity to um, really put us, switch the course a little bit and put us on a direction towards resilience, towards productivity, and then also towards profitability. Because as was mentioned in the comments, you know, farmers are business people and we can't be putting forward um, options for them that are going to undermine their business operations. So Darren um, already pointed out the one of the tools that we have, which is knowledge of the source of emissions in agriculture, and these are well known and well documented. Um, another piece of good news is that we also know about the solutions. They are already, you know, being implemented by farmers across the country. Those are known. Um, and there's and programs that could um, accelerate their widespread adoption across agriculture are also present. 
Um, and so if we look at in, uh, practices like um, enhanced rotations that will reduce nitrogen fertilizer use, breeding crops for low input production to again enhance performance without nitrogen fertilizers, looking at implementing on-farm renewables to reduce energy use on farms, best management practices in grazing, um, all of these things like, so Seed Change, the National Farmers Union, and about a dozen other agricultural organizations this year launched Farmers for Climate Solutions. Um, I think, you know, counter to popular belief, maybe farmers really want to be part of the climate solutions and actually need to be leading the process. Um, and so this is an unprecedented collaboration of farmer-led and farmer-supporting organizations representing all regions, all scales, all types of production to advance policies that will promote resilience in agriculture. Um, Pre-pandemic, our focus was on the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which is a five-year, $3 billion um, framework, which is the primary funding vehicle for uh, agriculture in Canada. So that already represents such an incredible opportunity. What would it look like to integrate agri-environmental programs and incentives across the, the cap? And then, you know, with the, <laughs> with the pandemic, um, you know, we still, in, in agriculture, you have to take a long-term view, um, but we can look at, with resources, implementing a lot of these solutions much faster training uh, young farmers to support renewal and to get people going in sustainable farm operations, the tree planting initiative, integrating edible trees into the tree planting program, um, providing agrologic support to farmers for, for the planting and for the maintenance. And then again, this kind of the agronomic agrological support that farmers are in dire need of to um, integrate and maintain and continue um, climate resilient farming. So again, the issues are known, the solutions are known and already being practiced by farmers across the country. And there are existing programs that could also really accelerate their widespread uh, adoption. Fantastic, well, that's optimistic. And I think the perfect person to turn to now is Laura Ellis, who's Senior Vice President of Policy and Partnerships at Alice Canada. And I just, Laura, in the chat window, there's a few questions about whether this can really work, whether regenerative agriculture is just a nice name and a nice idea, but not re cannot really be part of a working farmer's life. Um, you, I think, can uh, share your wisdom on that. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, thanks for um, the invitation to be here today. I've got my eye on the clock, so I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, the ALICE program um, is all about additionality, putting nature back on farms. Our success to date has shown that farmers are ready, farmers and ranchers are ready, willing and able to step up to the plate to, to provide environmental and climate solutions. Um, the, the, the ask uh, 400 million um, 10 million acres of marginal land converted back to nature. That's a completely doable, realistic goal. All other G7 nations, as Toby mentioned, have ecological goods and services uh, programs at national scale. Um, ALICE is, um, you know, endorsed by all of our major farm groups, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, NFU, uh, thanks Darren, um, as well as ecological farmers and Christian farmers. Um, an infusion of cash to, to marginal land projects for nature will create jobs, sequester carbon, have all sorts of natural infrastructure benefits that, that save communities uh, real dollars that can be reallocated um, for other uses. And rather than, you know, thinking about pulling uh, land away from farming, we are really increasing um, the sustainability of agriculture and food production. So putting grasslands, wetlands, planting trees in partnership with groups like uh, Rob's group, Forest Ontario, protects soil and water, provides pollination services for pollinator dependent crops, and gives farmers and ranchers an additional revenue stream. So it's a great idea. It's ready to scale in Canada. Um, we're ready to be a part of that. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's go time here. So that's, that's what we like to hear. It's, it's go time. It's nearly end time. I've got a couple more things to say. I just want to bring in Celine because I know you had a word to say on agriculture. Celine, you're on, you're on mute, Celine. Yeah, we, we, um, we're taking a page from the great work that's been done on reducing inputs um, to uh, propose a, a quick start 
a program that would enable um, and assist farmers to over that hump, the period of 18 months from, from the move to reducing high GHG um, intensive inputs, as Darren and Jane have uh, described, to um, moving towards nature's uh, fertilizers, the, the, the nitrogen uh, fixing crops, that, uh, legumes that provide um, a, a natural fertilizer through crop crop rotation. There's a worry that there would be a, a, a short term reduction in productivity and so by providing stimulus over 18 months uh, 200 million dollars it would enable farmers to get off that nitrogen treadmill move towards uh, those sustainable practices provide the agronomist uh, an expert advice in the very short term which uh, Darren and Jane have uh, described and of course that is completely complementary and supportive of uh, the proposal to in addition to that, um, return uh, 10 million acres to nature uh, by providing the ecological goods and services um, for sequestration of carbon and protecting our communities from um, sudden and uh, very expensive climate events. Thank you, Celine, for being brief and concise to the point. Last word goes to Terry Lynn. We heard about uh, uh, the indigenous community uh, in uh, forest custodianship. What about in the agricultural area? Have you thoughts on that? Um, just, you know, going back on some of the comments that we heard earlier, um, you know, talking about giving the giving the ownership back to the Indigenous communities and having them part of the, the planning and the land use planning uh, on their traditional territories, I think it's really important. I've seen this in communities where, uh, you know, co-management is actually more efficient than just merely consulting with the Indigenous communities um, and I believe that you know if we start uh, moving forward in that way that we'll see a lot of good progress. Fantastic thank you. I'm going to pop up now we usually do a couple of polls but we're going to just do one now. Melanie if you could pop up the agriculture poll please the second one uh, which you can get to while I'm saying my last final my final words this has been a really rich chat today. And actually, I think we've had a little bit more, what would I say disagreement is, is, uh, is too strong, but you know, the, the, there's lots of nuance in this area. And I think people are coming at it from different sides and that's really important. And we thank you so much for your questions, many of which we haven't answered, some we have, and your comments, which we will get to, absolutely. And we really appreciate your contribution on that. Um, the, the, the discussion I think has been really, broad today we've talked um about we're talking about systems we're talking about agriculture and forest systems we have to think broadly in these areas and that's what we've heard is we can't it's not a reductionist policy of let's just plant a few more trees and get a few more planters out there you know working piece rates and getting the, the seedlings into the ground that's not what we're talking about we're talking about trying to nurture natural capital we're talking about trying to create competitive um, industries in Canada and we're talking about trying to sequester carbon in uh, ways that will last beyond a, uh, a small incentive payment that lasts for one or two years. We're talking about changing the way we go about uh, thinking about agriculture and forestry uh, and uh, having a more healthy productive relationship. Science-based, yes, um, but broader and more systems oriented as we go forward. So with that, Quick summary, I hope. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thanks to all our great panelists today. We do hope that you'll join us. We've got two more of these uh, subject sector-based uh, events left. And then I believe, Toby, we have a, a wrap-up session at the end, I think. Um, so we really appreciate your participation. Thanks to everyone and have a good day.